recording now, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Jim Jasinski. I'm with OSU Extension, the IPM Program Coordinator. I'm here with Dr. Susan Jones from the Department of Entomology, who will be giving us her second webinar on pet bugs. Uh, so with that, Susan, are you all set to go? All set. Okay. If you can't hear us very well, uh, feel free to type it into the chat box. We'll try to speak up as best we can. But last time, I think the sound came in just fine, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Okay. And thank you for listening in. Today, uh, we are really going to concentrate on uh, integrated pest management strategies uh, for bed bugs and consider treating uh, for bed bugs. Um, in the first webinar, we talked about the basics of pest identification. You don't want to treat a situation for bed bugs when you really don't have bed bugs, and so we're going to make sure that we actually are dealing with bed bugs, not uh, some other pest. Uh, it's really important that you have a thorough inspection, use sanitation measures, and we started talking about sanitation measures and some non-chemical measures in webinar one, but now in webinar two, what we're going to do is uh, revisit some of those same issues, but in the context of using um, your non-chemical measures and applying insecticides to uh, targeted sites. So, uh, like I said, we will have that overlap, but we're going to uh, talk about other uh, treatment strategies. Uh, today, I hope that you will learn some things about uh, insecticide resistance, um, some of the tips uh, for hiring a uh, licensed pest management professional. Uh, we'll give some information on inspection and monitoring options, uh, pesticide regulations in Ohio, uh, some of the general treatment options such as heat treatments, uh, insecticide treatments, and then our bed bug products, uh, registered insecticides and uh, natural products. Uh, just to briefly recap from the last uh, week's presentation on webinar one, uh, we've really seen this worldwide resurgence of bed bugs uh, starting in the late 1990s. And in Ohio, uh, we have seen just a massive increase in bed bugs all over the, the state. I talked a bit in, in detail uh, about that. But in 2016, on the, in the right side map, uh, these are the counties that have the uh, most treatments by pest management companies. And bed bugs are, are really have, have just taken a hold in the state. <clears throat> in webinar one, we talked about uh, international travel, uh, housing with high tenant turnover, how that leads to uh, the resurgence of bed bugs. And in webinar two, now we're going to talk about pesticides and uh, insecticide resistance and its influence. Uh, Bed bugs are extremely challenging insects. You have to know so many details about their behavior. Um, but um, in today, we want to talk about uh, insecticide resistance. <laughs> So what's the definition of resistance? It's basically inherited uh, trait, and it means that a strain of some organisms, such as bug, bed bugs, can survive a doses of a toxicant that would kill the majority of those individuals in a normal population. So now we're ne dealing with insects that can survive massive doses of a toxicant in some cases that decades ago they would have immediately been uh, killed. Uh, we started reading about this in 2007 when this paper came out from the University of Kentucky and they said in this paper that they had looked at bed bugs that they had collected in northern Kentucky as well as in southern Ohio and they were 
finding extremely high levels of resistance in two of the very commonly used pyrethroid insecticides, deltamethrin and lambda cyhalophrin. Now, up here, I, I have told you a little bit of what is a pyrethroid. It's basically a class of uh, human-made uh, synthetic insecticides that mimic the structure and the properties of pyrethrum, which is a natural product. It comes from chrysanthemum uh, flowers. So now we're synthesizing this uh, large class of insecticides known as pyrethroids. And these University of Kentucky researchers are saying that they are finding very high levels of resistance in our state. They're also finding this is widespread in U.S. bed bug populations. Okay, all this goes back to our use of DDT and other uh, synthetic in insecticides. Uh, they were very, very effective because they had very long lasting residual. By residual, I mean when the product dries, it continues to be effective against a bed bug. So a bed bug gets in contact with a dry insecticide deposit is actually picking up sufficient amounts of the chemical, absorbing it through the skin, and it's affecting the bug. But when DDT came out, within a matter of years, bed bugs had developed a resistance to DDT. And now we see with our pyrethroids that they share a common active site and that is the nerve membrane and it's actually the voltage gate sodium ion channel in the nerve mem membrane but it just means that uh with our our use of ddt we're seeing cross resistance so now uh our use of pyrethroids we see this carryover with resistance so what has happened is uh, manufacturers have come up with new insecticides for use against uh, bed bugs that don't rely strictly on a pyrethroid. So um, I've got the active ingredient here and in parentheses below the active ingredient are the um, insecticide classes that are in those particular products that you on the label these are the names that you're going to see so there's a pyrethroid component but there's also a neonicotinoid which is another insecticide class uh, um, you've got here this particular product is a totally different insecticide class it's a halogenated pyro we've got silica gel we've got this is, is the latest product, which is actually has three components. Um, PBO is a synergist that improves the activity of a pyrethroid. And then we've got a neonicotinoid. Now, in general, these are the better products to use against bed bugs rather than strictly using a, a pyrethroid. But there's a lot of information that you need to know about these particular uh, products and how to rotate the use of these products. And the unfortunate news is uh, researchers are finding that even with these newer insecticides, bed bugs have started to develop resistance to them. Just just like what we saw with uh, DDT. So this first paper, which is from uh, New Mexico, uh, says that uh, transport, tandem, temperate, and alpine, that they looked at field collected bed bugs and, find, and finding that they are showing high levels of resistance, at least in some bed bug populations. In this other paper, which is, uh, from Purdue, they looked at 10 field strains and they said that, that, that they were reduced susceptibility so they weren't being affected to the same extent as they had in the past with three different strains of phantom, which is that uh, halogenated pyrrole, as well as bifenthrin, which is one of your uh, pyrethroids. And uh, um, so it doesn't matter what chemistry we come up with for bed bugs. Um, the fact that they have such a fast life cycle 
um, such a high reproductive capacity means that they will eventually develop uh, resistance to uh, in insecticides. Um, these are our general treatment options for uh, bed bugs, uh, in insecticide treatments, fumigation, which is using an insecticide, but you have to have a special license to do uh, fumigation and it's, it's, you have to vacate the, the property. It's extremely toxic gas. Uh, and then heat treatment, whether it be whole structure or container uh, heat treatment. But in my opinion, and, and many other researchers agree, not all of them, but that residual insecticide products are so important um, regardless of what treatment option you're using. Now, you have to take into consideration, can a person tolerate an insecticide treatment? Um, and we'll talk a little bit uh, more about that. But unless you have something left behind when something like a gas dissipates, there's nothing to protect you. When your heat is gone, there's nothing to protect you because it's the heat that's killing the bugs. So that's why it's useful to have something that you leave behind in place that complements and provides long-term uh, effects when you're using uh, a more temporary, uh, just uh, like a, a very short, uh, uh, residual products such as uh, fumigant and heat. So uh, I want to open this up to uh, questions right now and uh, um, Jim is going to coordinate that. Right, so we're just pulling up the chat box here. Um, let's see. Oh, yes, no. Um, we did have some technical issues like, like I said before, but those are kind of solved at this point in time. There's a question from Rory um, about the Northeast Ohio Bed Bug Task Force and if they can uh, post a link to this recording on their website and that's absolutely fine. Um, they can post a link to either Susan's or uh, the OSU IPM YouTube channel, no problem at all. Will we be able to get this PowerPoint? I think the answer is going to be yes. This is going to be just like the uh, first uh, webinar where Susan will post those slides. Uh, either likely to her website, uh, the u.osu.edu slash bedbugs site. And uh, we will send that summary information, both these webinar recordings and those two PowerPoints where you can find them later on. So great questions. Um, questions coming in. How effective is heat treatment for the average homeowner? Is it costly? Excuse me, is it costly? Uh, who does the treatment? Do you want to try to tackle that one, Susan? Yes, I can, I'll be providing more information about uh, heat treatments, but in general, a heat treatment is going to be double the cost of a, an insecticide treatment plan. And an insecticide treatment plan is not a single treatment, uh, not a single application, but rather it's typically needs to be three times. Uh, so you treat once, you wait an interval of time, you treat a second time, you wait an interval of time, and then you treat a third time. A single insecticide treatment will rarely, if ever, get rid of your bed bugs unless you maybe have a tiny, tiny beginning infestation or you can very rigorously use a lot of sanitation measures. Now, for heat treatment, uh, like I said, when the heat is gone, there's nothing to protect you. Um, a company does not have to be licensed to do heat treatment. They don't have to know anything about bed bugs to conduct heat treatments. It's only whenever they're applying pesticides that they need to be licensed. So you need to find out from companies uh, just how much do you know about bed bugs? What's your training on bed bugs? How do you determine the heat in the bed bug hiding places? And I hear more and more that um, they're having issues with heat, heat treatments because 
the individual doing the heat treatment is not using temperature probes. They're using a gun, uh, a temperature gun, that, and they're bouncing off the temperature off the wall. That is not what you need. You need a, a probe in the deep hiding places where the bed bugs are, or you need a temperature probe inside the wall void. Um, so heat treatment is also, um, some people think you can just raise the temperature in your house, your thermostat. You will just develop massive bed bug infestations if you do that, because you have to get the temperature up to 135 in the bed bug hiding places. It's not air temperature uh, yet. Oh, over the nation, I'm hearing, just like other researchers, that there are issues with heat treatment because it's not being done properly. <clears throat> okay, that's very thorough. If you need to grab yourself a glass of water there, Susan, go ahead. Um, you know, one thing that I've heard about uh, the heat treatments that I've always kind of curious about, and as connected to the practitioners, maybe you would know this answer. When you raise the temperature of a room to 135 and above, does that have any detrimental effects on electronics or plastics or anything of that nature that people need to be concerned about? Or do they take everything out of the room and then treat it? I mean, these are, I think, real world questions and considerations. What do you think about that? Oh, I, before a company does a heat treatment, they give you a long list of things that you have to take out of your uh, residence. For example, if you have ammunition, guns and such, those need to be taken out. If you have candles, they need to be taken out. If you have the old vinyl records, they are potentially uh, warped. You need, there are, there's this huge, long list. Okay, so that, that answers my question. So yes, there are some precautions that we have to, to deal with before we just, we don't just pop in a heater, turn it up, and then back the equipment back out. There's a whole procedure to it. And you're your heat treatment company is going to give you that long list. Okay, okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, we have one more question that came in the chat box. Um, it says, I also work for a 4-H camp. We absolutely do as much as we can to be proactive. We don't have any experience with bed bugs uh, until uh, we have the problem. Now uh, we do everything uh, we can to stay on top of the issue. Great, that's what you need to do. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Are we ready to continue on then? Let's go. Okay. There you go. Okay. I want to say, and put it in red here, eliminating a bed bug infestation, typically it's not a do-it-yourself task. Um, you have to have an in-depth knowledge of bed bugs biology and behavior. And that's why I spent so much time in webinar one giving you a lot of information about their biology and behavior. But I haven't touched all and everything that you need to know uh, about bed bugs. Uh, you also have to know about how to inspect for these bugs, uh, how you're going to monitor for them. You need to know an incredible amount about insecticides, uh, safety, the active ingredients, the formulations. For example, dust are really, really important when you're treating for uh, bed bugs because dust are formulated in such a manner that some of those dust particles will actually cling to the surface of the bug and the bugs, whenever they're moving around and aggregating together, they will transfer some of those dust particles to other uh, bugs. You also have to know about building construction uh, because they, as I showed last time, uh, depending on a uh, apartment uh, complex, the uh, uh, wall construction and such, the bugs are going to move between the walls to get to adjacent apartments. You also have to know with bed bugs, proper procedures, products, equipment, follow-up. So it is just something we try to tell homeowners uh, that it, 
are going to delay, the bit of problem will continue getting worse. And uh, then you may have done some things that make the problem worse, such as using your bug bombs, the over-the-counter uh, foggers, where you scatter the bugs. So now a pest control company that comes in has to deal with the problems that you have created, as well as the bed bugs. Uh, um, pest control companies realize that the labeling on the pesticide is the, is the law. It's a federal law. Uh, Ohio Revised Code says no person shall apply, use, directly supervise the application or use or recommend a pesticide in a way that is inconsistent with the pesticide's labeling. So I've included the, a uh, link so that you can go and look at those codes yourself. Um, OSU website, Pesticide Education Program, has some really, really useful information on pesticides and pesticide safety, so please send the people here so that they can better understand what they are dealing with when they are using different insecticides. Here is what I see all the time. Uh, um, I see massive amounts of some unknown product uh, right next to laundry. You are now uh, potentially uh, contaminating the very clothing that you wear. Uh, you are sitting in insecticide deposits. Every time you sit down, you are uh, literally having some of those particles become air bound. This is what people do when they don't understand how to properly use pesticides. Uh, they do things like using products that don't work. Be aware, a boric acid product doesn't kill bed bugs. It is a stomach poison. It has to be eaten by the bug. It is then absorbed through the lining of the gut, and it works that way. A bed bug feeds on blood. It doesn't feed on boric acid. Boric acid works for cockroaches. It doesn't work for a uh, bed bug. And people need to recognize that different insects are impacted differently. They have different mouth parts, and that's something that the ordinary person just doesn't even take into uh, consideration, which I can totally understand. Um, diatomaceous earth, that's widely used by uh, people, uh, and it is a relatively safe uh, material. However, they need to realize that if it gets wet, it, then it will never reconstitute. It will never be effective again. So we did this study in, in my lab and found that uh, the dry deposits worked. If it was wetted, it was now down at the level of, of the control. So it had lost all uh, effectiveness. If you go in and spray an insecticide on top of a diatomaceous earth uh, uh, product, then you know that's wetting it. That's eliminating its effectiveness. Um, grocery store sprays, uh, but oftentimes they say in very small letters, kills on contact. That means it's a contact insecticide. A contact insecticide is one where the liquid contacts the bug, the liquid kills the bug. These bugs are hiding and they're not gonna be killed. Uh, uh, by the uh, contact toxic. And it's furthermore going to break down very, very quickly. Another uh, consideration with grocery store insect sprays is that they're very low, low concentrations of the insecticide. They're not the product that the pest control professional is using oftentimes, and it's definitely not the concentration that they are, are using. So, uh, it's important that you contact a professional uh, pest control company, and you have to make sure they're licensed. Um, it's a, a law that uh, um, if you're treating for bed bugs under certain conditions, you have to be licensed.
license, and I'll talk about that. But you can go to the uh, Ohio Department of Agriculture website. It's going to list uh, licensed companies and applicators. I've included the, the, a website for them. I've included uh, phone numbers as well with contact information. When you're hiring a pest management company, here's some of the, the questions you should consider asking them. Um, you know, are you a member of a local uh, or a regional or a national uh, association? If you are, then you're getting a lot of training. How long have you been in business? Uh, what is your experience for, with bed bugs? You might have been in, in business for 30 years, but if you've only been doing bed bug work for one year, that's a totally different uh, aspect. What types of treatments do you do? What types of chemicals? Uh, give me a cost estimate. What sort of service agreement do you offer? Um, and, and then you can ask to see other uh, information. Now, I have a fact sheet with uh, other uh, colleagues, members of the pest management uh, industry on tips for choosing a pest management company. Um, you should obtain at least three competitive bids when uh, you're choosing a pest management company. And for each company, you want to look at satisfied customer references that directly relate to bed bug control. Some companies may do excellent cockroach control and yet not be quite up to speed for bed bugs. Um, the Chamber of Commerce may be a place you could get some information, Better Business Bureau, uh, places like Angie's List, which no, you no longer have to pay to be uh, to look at their website. Um, so you can get some actual feedback from customers who have used these uh, uh, companies. And then you can, uh, this is a link for this uh, um, fact sheet. Okay, so probably uh, want to take a, a little quick time right now and see if there are any uh, questions uh, so far. Okay, Susan, let's see what's in the chat box. <clears throat> okay, let's see, we're gonna go back here a little bit. Um, Previous question coming from a, so there's a there's a uh, follow up on the 4-H uh, camp question. I was in reference to the previous question coming from the 4-H camp perspective. Would you recommend a proactive approach such as a residual treatment, or does that need to happen after bed bugs have been detected? So should they treat ahead of infestation or find the infestation and then treat? I think is essentially what they're asking. You, you should be fi finding a bed bug uh, before you're doing a, a treatment. But if you're in an apartment that is next door to a unit that has a massive bed bug infestation, then you would consider doing a proactive tree preventive treatment because you're right next to a massive infestation and we know that bed bugs will move between the walls uh, depending on the type of uh, construction so it all depends <laughs> so it, it sounds like the answer for the 4-h camp would be you need to detect them first and then begin your treatments but if you're in a situation such as a, a multi-unit apartment where you know there's bed bugs around you then it's okay to then preventatively or proactively treat to prevent an infestation. Is yes, that correct. So there are a lot of things you have to take into account when you are looking at treating for bed bugs, but uh, typically you want to make sure you that bed, it's bed bugs that's your problem in the first place. Right, right. So we went over that in quite some detail in the first webinar to make sure the identification piece is very accurate. Um, I don't see any other questions there, but feel free to keep uh, typing those in. We'll stop every few minutes and answer those questions. Uh, so, Susan, let's go ahead and continue on. Okay. So, in Ohio, <clears throat> when do you have to be licensed as a, with a pesticide applicator license? Okay. Anytime a pesticide application is made 
or higher. So you, somebody is getting money. Now, if you're getting money to apply that pesticide, Ohio requires that you have a license. Uh, if you're a public employee uh, and you're applying a pesticide, you have to be licensed. Uh, if you're applying pesticides to a publicly accessible site, such as a restaurant, a school, hospital, a park, then you have to be licensed. If you are a, uh, in an apartment and there are more than four apartments, being in apartment units at one location, you have to have a pesticide license to do the uh, application of the pesticide. Uh, and so uh, I've kind of broken this out as a separate slide. Uh, for those of, uh, people who are apartment uh, managers or, or rental uh, owners and managers, if there are more than four apartment units at one location, then you have to be licensed as a commercial applicator to apply pesticides at those properties. Now, I am not a regulator. I'm a, a researcher and I'm an entomologist. So uh, that's why I gave you the information on the uh, uh, High Department of Agriculture pesticide license, because that's who you contact. You don't contact me, or you contact the pesticide education program to get more information about um, uh, Ohio uh, law. Now, uh, as pertaining to pesticide. Now, um, in Ohio, what, what treatment has been done by a pest management company, I put here pest, PMP, Pest Management Professional, you have to request the information. So if you're a resident or you're a customer, on request, the provider must provide a legibly written statement that details the name of each product used, the amount of each product that was applied, and the date of application. Then you as an individual can go and look up that product information online or via other sources, but it is on request. They do not have to give it to you voluntarily. Uh, they don't have to leave it behind. <clears throat> you have to have asked for it. So they don't have to tell you the company either, just those three things? They, well, they have right. to give you the name. These are the things that okay. uh, are, they have to give you. So so the, the company is not part of that. They don't have to tell you it was you know, Clark's pesticide company that put these products on. That is a question for the- Okay, the, the regulators. The regulators. Yep, yeah. perfect. And uh, I try to stay away from yeah, <laughs> I got it. I totally got it. Yeah. We're educators, not regulators. I got it. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So in apartment <clears throat> situations, what is an obligation of a landlord? Okay. If you have a rental agreement, then you have to follow all of the building codes, the housing codes, the health codes, the safety codes that affect health and safety. You have to make all the repairs. You have to do what is reasonably necessary to keep the uh, premises uh, in a safe and sanitary condition. The tenant uh, has to, uh, if they are party to a rental agreement, they have to make sure that the premises that are safe and sanitary, they have to comply with the re requirements that are imposed by all of these different codes. And the tenant cannot unreasonably withhold consent for the landlord to enter. Now, we are in a local rule state. That means that every municipality is going to have a different code. So in Columbus, where I am, here's what it, it says that for the responsibility of the owners and the occupants, it says that the owner is responsible for elimination of any insects, rodent, rats, pests, where there are two or more dwelling units on the premise. This, and this, this, this should be he or she is also <laughs> responsible for uh, if it's caused by improper uh, rat, pr rat proofing of the premises. Uh, in Columbus, it also says that the uh, 
occupant is responsible for elimination <coughs> of uh, pests uh, in apartment dwelling containing two or more dwellings, blah, blah, blah. So everything is going to vary depending on the municipality and the applicable code. Uh, and that is one of the issues with being a local rural state is everything is different all over the, the state. Uh, and so you have no one entity where you can say, oh, everything applies in the, in the, the state. Uh, um, now, you also have to consider different situations. So in a public facility, you're going to deal with bed bugs differently than you are in multifamily housing in your residence. You have to first consider, well, how did they even get here in the, in the first place? And they are usually going to be brought in by a visitor or a staff member who has bed bugs in their home and is bringing bed bugs with them when they come to work. They, they are going to be, uh, they're going to come in on someone's coat or their shoes or their uh, purse, briefcase, a wheelchair, a walker. And then that bug can potentially climb off that item and get into a chair, get into carpeting, get into equipment and whatever. But just because you see a single bug doesn't mean you have an infestation. It's not a me, it will a reason that you panic, you close down the business, it means that you do further investigation. And the first thing is capture a bug for positive identification. Staff needs to be trained what to look for, <coughs> cleaning crews, maintenance. Uh, everybody needs to, to, to know that you are dealing with bed bugs. This is a fact of life. We're all dealing with bed bugs. Um, and you have to capture that bug for positive identification. Now, I put in some more details about what you're looking for. If you do find that it's a bed bug, then you need to, to know, is it an adult bug? Or if it's, is it a, one of those five nymphal stages? Well, if it's a nymph, that means it's an immature bug. It's too young to be even re reproduced. It's not yet laying eggs. Okay, I showed you last time how to tell the difference in the adult stage with the males and the females by looking at the tip of the body and males have this pointed shape, females have this rounded shape that varies a bit when they're fully engorged with blood, but you often don't see them when they're fully engorged with blood because that's when they want to hide, digest their blood meal, and then they come out uh, once they are uh, more in a more flattened stage. Okay, so we find an adult. Now we're gonna look and we're gonna say, oh, it's a male. He is never gonna lay eggs. <laughs> if we look at a female and she's extremely flat, then it's not likely that she's laying eggs because mating occurs very soon after a female finishes feeding on her blood meal. Uh, um, and so, um, and bed bugs feed about once a week. They don't feed every day. Uh, um, so there are all these things that you consider in addition to just, oh, it's a bed bug. You look at more detail and that typically takes a, an expert to tell you what you're uh, looking at. Okay, so then do we want, how do we find out if we really have an issue beyond this one bed bug? Uh, visual inspections, as I said last time, can be uh, very misleading because these bugs hide all over the place. So I'm just giving you some examples of some of the devices that can be put out. Uh, these are our interceptor type devices. I've put a few names here, but there are a lot of other uh, names out there. Uh, they're often positioned under the uh, furniture leg. And then uh, bugs that fall in this center ring have come down from the leg of the bed or the furniture item. If they're in this outer ring, they've come from some place other than the furniture item. So it gives you directionality 
of the bugs. Uh, but people don't necessarily look at where the bug is in the interceptor. This particular one, you have to keep it, uh, the walls coated with talcum powder. And what happens with talcum powder is as a bug tries to climb out, it catches hold of a little particle of talcum powder. It falls off and the bug comes crashing down to the bottom of the interceptor. If it doesn't have this thin coating of talcum powder, the bug climbs out and you have then made it of the situation where, where you've got an interceptor, but it's not working properly because you haven't maintained it. Um, this one, uh, uh, Blackout, um, it, it, uh, the name has, has changed. Uh, um, it's, I think it's called Lights Out now. Uh, the walls of this one are slick enough that the bugs can't climb out. Uh, but if I press this, uh, if I put this interceptor and have a uh, bed of uh, dust ruffle that is reaching down into that interceptor, I just it, it made it where it doesn't work anymore because I've given the bugs an alternate way to escape without having those slick surfaces uh, to deal with. So interceptors, like there's recent research that you can just place these out in the open and there's a potential that some of the bugs will just fall into them and you'll be able to capture them that way. Now people like very easy things. Um, sticky traps do not do very well with bed bugs. They are not very useful uh, for detecting bed bugs. Now, if you have a massive infestation, yes, maybe you'll capture uh, some bed bugs. If you have a low level infestation, then your sticky traps typically are not a, a very useful uh, tool for, for you to use. Even a sticky trap that tells you, oh, I have a uh, incorporated uh, chemical that's luring in the bugs, a pheromone. Has that company done any research on that product? Or are they just telling you that on the label without any research information whatsoever? You go to the website and you see testimonials. Test, you don't know who's testifying. Is it the, the owner's mother? Is it the owner's brother? Is it the owner himself? Is it the owner who has paid somebody to do a, to give this uh, testimonial? You want on a website to find actual research information and it should be from a reputable source and they should tell you what strain of bed bugs they tested because uh, there's one strain of, of bed bugs called the Harlan strain that has been reared in the laboratory since the 1970s. It is extremely susceptible to every insecticide out there. If they have used the Harlan strain, everything's going to work. If they've used a field strain, a contemporary field strain, you aren't going to get the same results as you would with the Harlan strain. So I'm, I'm just trying to say there are many, many considerations when dealing with bed bugs. And uh, I'm just touching on a, a few of the uh, issues. Okay, we're going to go ahead and check the chat box again and see if uh, we have any more questions. Looks like something popped up. Uh, so a question says, what if the landlord refuses to treat contiguous apartments to the infested apartment? So somehow it's known that one of the units is infested. What about the other units? That's a common problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> moving on. <No. laughs> uh, um, and, and so uh, more than four units then the owner has to have hired a licensed pest control company. And the licensed pest control company probably is telling the owner, you know, this is unwise for me just to be in here treating this one unit. But they can't require the owner 
to do the preventive work. And in general, uh, a lot of the uh, leases say you as a tenant should not be doing anything in your apartment when it comes to pest control. Mm -hmm. So that's where you start doing intensive monitoring. <laughs> you start doing intensive uh, sanitation measures and uh, uh, um, start uh, talking to the owner and uh, giving them some information from all of these really useful websites, trying to convince them that they are not doing the right thing when it comes to uh, dealing with bed bugs when you have a massive infestation in one unit because it's really, uh, you are putting at jeopardy the uh, adjacent units. So it sounds like the monitoring and the documentation that, you know, there is a problem here and next door, that kind of is a conversation that sort of happens and it's not. And you need to document in writing <laughs> that you have uh, communicated with the pest, with the uh, owner mm -hmm. about this and communicated the first time you found a bed bug in your uh, apartment. Mm -hmm. And then every time you follow up, document it because and uh i'm just gonna say document 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 in writing okay yeah so i think that gets at the crux of it uh you know so it's it's really kind of a upon you to document the case that you do have them and uh sounds like in most cases you're not allowed to preemptively treat just based on the knowledge there might be read your lease. to the left or the right so read read your lease we are Educators and not regulators here, so we're, we're just telling you the way it is. Uh, unfortunately, we can't solve all of the problems because it's, it's a complicated matter. So it's not one answer fits all scenarios. Yeah, and, and I'm thinking that we probably need to have a third webinar where we bring in the Ohio pesticide regulators and have them talk to some of the extension educators and do a webinar and answer questions. Yeah, so in, if you think that might be interesting to have the regulators in the room and ask these questions about regulation and where to go for enforcement and those types of things, why don't you just put a couple of comments in the chat box and then if we have enough, we might consider trying to arrange that later on once we get some time in our schedules. All right, Susan, why don't you go ahead and continue doing a great job. <clears throat> okay, uh, now. The treatment approach that you are going to come up with bed bugs is going to be specifically tailored to the setting, whether it be a public facility, a single family home, multifamily housing. You also have to consider the occupants. Do you have pregnant women in there? Are there infants in there? Are there people whose health is compromised? Are there very elderly people? You also have to consider the severity of the bed bug problem. Do you have a sighting, a single bed bug, or do you have an infestation? An infestation means that you have bed bugs laying eggs with multiple stages. That is an infestation versus a sighting, an incident, uh, uh, and so all of those things come into uh, play. Now, if you're in a very sensitive environment, you really do not want to be using insecticides. You want to go with your non-chemical options, heat treatment. Now, cold, as I tried to show in the first webinar, cold, use, its usefulness is very limited. Uh, sanitation measures, you know, such as uh, steam, uh, uh, these are some of the things, and let's talk a little bit about when you're doing whole room heat treatment, because we had that question uh, early on. Okay, so you have specialized equipment when you're doing heat treatment. Uh, before you start the heat treatment, the company has come in, they have removed the mattress, uh, they have uh, um, made sure that you have complied with that whole list. Uh, so they're gonna ask you, okay, did you remove your ammunition? Did you remove candles? Did you remove anything that can explode in here? Did you re remove certain items that may melt? Um, 
they, they have a, uh, a heat device. They have fans in there and the fans are blowing and moving the heat all over the place. And then they have temperature probes and they are monitoring on this screen every single temperature probe and they're making sure that every site has gotten up to temperature and they're trying to reach inside the items and inside the wall with 135 degrees. Now, it's typically a six to eight hour process that depends on the type of, of heat uh, treatment equipment that they're uh, using. Uh, as I said, it typically is double or more the cost of an insecticide treatment. So if you are looking at a uh, heat, I mean, an insecticide treatment with the three follow-up treatments, it's going to typically cost um, several hundred dollars, 300, 400, 500 dollars. Uh, heat treatment in a small one unit, one bedroom apartment, a thousand dollars, eight hundred dollars maybe. Um, but when the heat's gone, there's nothing left behind. And so that's why you include that residual insecticide. All of the manufacturers have looked at their insecticides and determined they don't break down at this temperature of 135 uh, degrees or thereabouts. So the chemical is going to be able to withstand those uh, heat treatment temperatures and the insecticide is going to be uh, have uh, been applied before the heat was done. Now, during the heat treatment process, obviously, the pest control company cannot remain in the, the home because uh, it is just too hot to stay in there for any period of time. But they are going to be coming in every 30 minutes or so, and they're going to be taking these clothes and they're going to be fluffing them so that the heat further penetrates. They're going to be taking the mattress. They're going to be turning it so that now one surface gets more heat than the other surface. Uh, they're going to be adjusting the position of the fans depending on what they're uh, temperature probes are, are saying and, and such. So when your heat treatment professional comes in and they sit outside in their truck for three hours, do you think you have an effective heat treatment? <laughs> um, so there are just so many things. We can have an entire um, PowerPoint strictly on heat treatment from a heat treatment professional, and they will give you so much information. You'll have your head spinning. Uh, um, and so you have to recognize that I'm just barely touching on the different aspects of uh, heat treatment, but lots and lots of things to uh, consider. Um, you can do your own containerized uh, heat treatment uh, process. They're different. This is just one example. Uh, um, University of Florida had on their website tells you how to, to uh, come up with developing your own heat treatment uh, chamber and such. Uh, I alluded to this like last time. There is a product out there on the market where you can use uh, a cold treatment it never should be used as a standalone measure for bed bugs. Uh, you need to be using other things along with this, this uh, cold treatment. And these do-it-yourself sanitation measures also do need to be used concurrently or when you've got a, a, a low-level infestation or you're trying to do uh, um, some of the measures yourself to reduce the number of bedbugs you've got. Notice on this list we're not using insecticides. These are sanitation measures. So vacuuming, using a handheld steamer, using that clothes dryer. I can't emphasize enough the clothes dryer, the cheapest option for most residents and one of the most effective because insecticides are not to be applied to 
items that you wear. They're not to be applied to items that you, betting items, unless it says so on the label. And there's so few labels that will allow the, the insecticides to be applied. Um, continuous freezing, the, you know, we're looking at four days or three weeks at these uh, uh, temperatures. I think in my first webinar, one of these uh, temperatures was incorrect. I hate to say I have corrected it on, on this one and possibly there's some way we can go in on the first webinar and, and uh, correct it. But, uh, you know, it's typically a chest type freezer that uh, is going to allow you to get down to these really, really low temperatures. But regardless of what a resident is doing in terms of sanitation, they've got to reduce clutter. If you've got a lot of clutter, bugs are going to be hiding in lots of places. They're going to be difficult to detect. If you're trying to have your pest control company come in and do a treatment, it's going to be very, very difficult. And if you have a hoarder, then even with heat treatment, they can't turn and move the items and allow the heat to penetrate into all of those places. So if you've got massive amounts of clutter, a heat treatment uh, will not work. Uh, so, you know, you've got these uh, treatment options, but there are lots of things to uh, consider when you're uh, using those uh, treatment options. And so let's, let's just uh, go back to this point and stop for any more questions in case anybody has any. Okay. Check the chat box here, see what we have. Okay. Uh, looks like nothing new has come in. Uh, since the last time, so I think we're caught up to speed with that. Um, we are now about 55 minutes till the end. I'm not sure where you're at in your presentation, but I have about 55 minutes left. I'll be, I'll have stopped long before 55. Okay, good, good, <laughs> okay. excellent. People love to hear that. Got a late start, but we're gonna have an early finish. <laughs> we love that. Okay, so, <clears throat> so with these treatment options, and the insecticide uh, component. I want to uh, give you a bit about if you're using insecticides, and, and this is using an insecticide alone approach, and, but that means you're using all your sanitation measures, but you're not using heat and you're not using a, a fumigant. If you're using insecticide, it takes on average two to three insecticide treatments. A label is going to say, what interval you can reapply. So if I'm looking at product X, the label may say you can't reapply this product for 14 days. It is okay to go in with product Y and apply it during that 14 day period. You just can't use product X for 14 more days. So if you find that you still have bed bugs, you go in with your different product and apply apply it. You want to be using different formulations, meaning different dusts, different sprays, and these different uh, insecticides. This was a, the, one of the questions that I asked in both to my 2011-2016 surveys of the pest management industry. When you're using an insecticide alone approach, how many times does it take you to get rid of an infestation? And it's right up here at around two to three. Uh, you can go with some infestations need many more uh, treatments, but uh, a company that tells you they will get rid of bed bugs in one treatment. Okay, what do we have here? We have about 8% of the time. That is how what the number that's needed to get rid of infestation and in most cases it's going to be that larger uh, number so when you're using insecticides got to have that residual also we need to recognize it's time intensive and labor intensive you've got to spot treat all harvest sites the first time a company comes in using insecticides it is going to take them uh, several hours minimum 
not five minutes, not a quick walk around the room spray, but they are going in and they're turning items. They're discovering all of those hiding places by looking behind the pictures, looking on the underside of, of uh, furniture, uh, looking in the electrical outlets, looking for the telltale signs and knowing that they've got a spray uh, behind the baseboards. And in some cases, taking off the um, smoke detectors up on the ceiling because the folks are hiding in the smoke detectors. They're hiding in some cases inside curtain rods. So they're taking the curtain rods off. Uh, it, it's not this little short period of time. First time in there, it is going to be hours. Second time, okay, now the problem areas they can concentrate on, on those and it's gonna take less time. And again, these tend to be the better products because you're not relying on just that one class of insecticides and dust products seem to be particularly important and not all of these are dust products. So some of these only come as a, a liquid type of, of product. Uh, furthermore, you have to realize that even with the same product, an insecticide doesn't necessarily kill bed bug eggs. So this was a paper that was published from Mississippi State. And uh, up here is what's happened with our, our in our control. So these bugs, have, these eggs have not been treated. You don't want to have a bar that is up next to the control because it means that virtually every egg hatched. And here we see that even with one of our new products, Phantom, the suspension concentrate formulation was not effective in killing eggs. But Phantom pressurized insecticide or PI, it killed almost all of the eggs some a few of them hatched so you did have to have something that was going to kill those newly uh, hatched eggs <clears throat> now i put up here perpoxer because that's one of the products that we're no longer allowed to use indoors it killed every single egg we don't have the same products that we had de de decades ago product use has has uh, changed um, here's another paper uh, talking about uh, eggs, and this is from uh, Clemson saying that uh, they directly sprayed the eggs. That's contact. That means they had to see the eggs. These weren't eggs that were hiding. Those were not affected. Uh, but in the lab, and they looked at a high resistant bed bug strain. They also looked at the Harlan strain. I'm not even giving you the Harlan strain data because that is what we call an internal control where we want to make sure that our procedures work. Uh, and this is telling us our products work. Uh, so with Bedlam, which you can get, and it, it allow, it's allowed to be sprayed on fabric, on surfaces, <clears throat> the majority of eggs hatch and almost every single nymph hatch. You can buy this product. Okay, they looked at demand, uh, the uh, uh, suspension concentrate, majority of eggs hatch, but no nymphs uh, survive. Now, this is a pyrethroid. Uh, if we had tested a different strain of bed bugs, then we might find that we had massive numbers of nymphs. So depending on what strain you're testing, you get different uh, results. Now, here we move to Phantom SC and just like in the previous uh, slide that I showed, almost all the eggs hatched, but very few of the nymphs were able to survive. So, okay. Here. This is, might be good for nymphs. This might be good for nymphs. We get to temperate and uh, finally we find one where uh, very few of the eggs hatched, 
and you know, around 40% of them survive. So maybe that's going to uh, help as well. So this is why you have to use that combination of insecticide. Now, if we went back and looked at the previous slide with a different strain, we would find that this product gave better results. So different strains of bugs react differently to the insecticides. That's another thing that you have to consider and you have to consider the, the stage of the uh, bed bug. Now, homeowners like to use over-the-counter natural uh, products. Um, and the websites oftentimes have fabulous claims. Um, they, they talk about how wonderful of a product that you're going to solve for bed bug infestation using some of these natural products. Now, if we were gonna solve our bed bug infestation uh, problem nationwide, everybody would be using that, pro that product and we wouldn't be having massive bed bugs like we still have. Uh, they are exempt from registration which means there's no oversight regarding them either. So nobody makes sure that they are uh, actually uh, having test uh, efficacy data. EPA is not requiring them to have efficacy data. Uh, Federal Trade Commission may go after the company for false claims, but that's in, in a very rare uh, circumstance. And the claims often are based on these satisfied customers. You need to have research data and you need to be able to evaluate it carefully. And most residents, no, most non-professionals can evaluate it uh, carefully. Oftentimes, a natural product is a plant-based product. It has a very strong odor and they typically break down very quickly because they are these plant-based uh, products. So Rutgers has done a number of, of papers on uh, natural products and they've looked at these uh, different ones. This is from just one of their uh, papers. They also compared it to uh, some of the products that are regulated by the EPA that are uh, produced by the pest management industry. And here we've got how many bed bugs died? Okay, we wanted to kill 50% or more. And here's how many died at 10 days. 10 days is a long time to have five of 10 bed bugs still alive. <laughs> okay, but Eco Writer did kill them. Bed bug control killed about 92% of them. Our Tempered killed 100%, and it happened in three days' time. <coughs> Demand, which is your pyrethroid, uh, against the bugs that they tested, it was less than 50% uh, mortality. So um, they've done more research, and in general, this is the one product that seems to be the better of all of the different uh, pest and, uh, natural products that are out there but there are new ones coming out all of the time and they're not paying a, a, a researcher to do the research on the, on the product. And so we can't say that that is the best product, but I'm just saying you need to take, exercise a lot of caution when you are saying, I'm gonna go with a, a, a natural product. So, uh, I hope you now are familiar with some of these different issues, understanding that, that it's best to hire a pest management professional, but you're going to have checked out that person. You're going to have your three different uh, uh, quotes, and you're going to have checked out each of those different uh, companies that, that, you know, inspection and monitoring, you know, you've got to have some of that going on. There are regulations out there. There are different things you need to deal with when whether you're considering heat treatment or insecticides. And you know, there's gonna be so much different data out there. Um, my website, the, the u.osu.edu, where I'm putting actual research papers on that site, the summary, that is where you're gonna go to actually find some of these uh, efficacy data, but you need to be able to 
read those papers and interpret them and they're not user friendly. They are in jargon for, for experts, for entomologists. And so uh, bed bugs are just a, a huge, huge uh, issue. I do want to acknowledge so many people who uh, contri have contributed. I've added the Ohio Department of Ag Pesticide Regulation uh, section for giving me information that I incorporated in this uh, uh, particular uh, webinar, the funding uh, services. And then I'd like to say thanks again, and let's just open it up to, to questions. All right, Susan, well, that was great. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and see what's in the chat box now we'll pop this back up here for us okay <clears throat> so there's a question about natural products it says the natural products can these increase resistance to approved pesticides like diatomaceous earth okay uh, uh they don't uh, up here too. they don't uh they up here to uh particularly not a Affect the uh, the licensed products. Um, in general, um, we haven't seen resistance with the natural uh, uh, products because they're so short lived. Uh, um, and whether it'll happen in the in the future, we don't know. Uh, but you have to consider: Are they killing many bugs in the first place? And so many of them are killing so few bugs in the first place the that they're not, is, they're not yeah. developing resistance because yeah. the product isn't working. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so um, just a kind of a question I would have is there's some way that there might be a summary of uh, like that table you put out where the natural products are here and kind of rank how well they do in terms of efficacy and maybe the uh, synthetic products and how well they do in terms of rank their efficacy. Would that be something that would be useful, do you think, for educators to have that on hand? Um, or are there just too many products and they keep changing and it's really hard to keep up with? It, it's very hard to keep up with. Now, Rutgers, if you go to, to the Rutgers website, they have done the most research mm -hmm. on natural products and they have probably three or four published uh, papers, including some in the trade journals, which uh, um, aren't quite as technical as the ones that are in uh, the entomological uh, uh, journals. Um, I can put their data, I can summarize some of their data. They aren't gonna have tested every single natural product that's out there. Right. Um, and so maybe you'll get some information on particular products, but because the natural products don't have to have research information, they don't pay for the research information, therefore you will never get the research mm -hmm. information. Furthermore, you'll find on some uh, products, they will use the data from a competitor and say, we have the same active ingredient, therefore my product mm -hmm. works the same as yours. No, it all goes more around to the formulation of the product. You have to have the exact product that you are marketing being tested. Mm -hmm. You can't take your competitor's data and say, oh, one of their components is mine, or their component is mine, but I formulated it differently. You know, aren't going to get the same results because formulation really matters. Formulation is important. Okay. Okay, a few other questions have come in. Um, let's see. The hardest part of my bed bug consults is telling folks there is no financial help for those that can't afford treatment. Do you have any suggestions? Well, the uh, Cuyahoga County Bed Bug uh, Task Force website, they, they do have that tab that I showed you last time where you can link in and they do have some places in North, Northeast Ohio where you might be able to get some help for uh, clients. Uh, in, gener in general, you know, if you've got elderly people or people who are disabled, you know, talking to a provider and trying to uh, talk with them to get some sort of financial help for that, that person. Uh, bed books are devastating. <laughs> and yet they are so ignored by 
our state government, by our federal government, uh, by so many people that it is just a frustrating uh, issue for people like you and I who are educators who are trying to help the uh, public. That bugs your community wide problem. They need to be dealt with as such, which means that we can't do it by ourselves. All right, another a question that would come up. Uh, let's see, um, just a comment here. Uh, what about bat bugs versus bed bugs? Will the pesticides for bed bugs kill bat bugs? Okay, the same insecticides may kill the bat bugs, but bat bugs are in a different part of the house. They are up in the attic where your bats are roosting. And a few of them have come down into the living environment. And so you're treating the living environment when you're treating for bed bugs. You aren't treating the attic area when you're treating for bed bugs. So you have your bat bugs continuing to breed and a few of them coming down and getting on uh, uh, people. Now, uh, last, in the first webinar, I talked about how you uh, tell the difference uh, from the external features of the bat bug versus the bed bug. And that is the first step is identi proper identification. If a company comes in and treats for bed bugs and you have bat bugs, they have violated the first principle, which is they're not treating for the proper insect. It's not on the, on the label, as you would say, right? Well, it might be on the label, but you haven't targeted the right place. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, that's why you want to have a reputable company <laughs> and one who has dealt with bed bugs and recognizes that, oh, if I'm seeing this thing that looks like a bed bug, but it's really hairy, much hairier than what I've normally seen, they send it to somebody like me and I check it out and say, you got a bat bug there. You don't have, or you have a bird bug. We haven't even talked about bird bugs, <laughs> swallow bugs and, and, and such. Uh, um, identification is the basis for how you proceed. Okay. So um, let's see, I don't see any other questions up in the chat box right now. Um, we're pretty much at the end of the webinar, I think. Uh, Susan, did you have any last comments you wanted to add? <laughs> we only have 33 minutes, so temper yourself. <laughs> uh, um, this is an issue where we need to get our legislators involved uh, and at, at the state level, at the federal level asking them to please help us with the, the, the uh, bed bug problem. It's not going away. It's only getting worse. The only thing that is a, a, a little glimmer of hope is people are recognizing uh, bed bugs a bit earlier and I'm not seeing those massive, massive infestations that I saw 10 years ago. Uh, I still see them from time to time, but 10 years ago, every place I went into had a massive infestation. Uh, uh, like I said, it's a community-wide problem. It needs to be something that we address from one community to another community to another community. We, we let our health officials know that this is a pest of significant public health importance. You cannot neglect to this insect. Uh, um, it, we don't even begin to know all of what we are going to know about bed bugs and how they impact health. Uh, it, you know, 10 years from now, people are going to be telling you something totally different about the health effects of bed bugs, and it may be very scary. Well, on that note, I think we'll uh, go ahead and wrap it up. I, I want to thank Susan uh, for putting the time in for these two webinars. It was quite an effort, but I think she did an excellent job. I want to thank all of the participants for sticking it through for a couple of hours. And we really do hope that this 
um, these series of these two webinars did help you quite a bit. Understanding the larger problem didn't solve all of the issues that you may have, but it got you further in terms of what to do if clients come in that have these kinds of questions.